The Hare and the Tortoise One day, a hare, the quickest runner among the animals, met a slow old tortoise plodding along. You old slow coach, she laughed. Can't you go any faster than that? Will you have a race with me, said the tortoise, and see which one of us gets to the winning post first? Of course I will, said the hare, and I shall certainly win. So off they went. Of course the hare soon left the tortoise far behind. She thought the race was a great joke, and when she'd gone halfway, she began to play, nibble the grass, and practice big jumps. Then she began to feel tired. I will have a little nap, she thought. Even if the tortoise does go past me when I am asleep, I can easily catch him up again when I wake up. So she lay down in the shady spot and fell fast asleep. Meanwhile, the tortoise was coming slowly, but steadily along. He did not stop to eat, or to rest, or to sleep. He just kept on and on. He passed the hare where she lay asleep and went quietly on towards the winning post. Suddenly the hare woke up. I must have slept too long, she cried. Where is that tortoise? I must catch him up. Off she ran, but the tortoise was nowhere to be seen. On and on ran the hare till she came to the winning post. And there was the tortoise, already there and waiting for her. Slow and sure wins the race. The story of the little crooked man. I expect you know the rhyme. There was a crooked man and he walked a crooked mile. He found a crooked sixpence upon a crooked stile. He bought a crooked cat who caught a crooked mouse and they all lived together in the little crooked house. But don't think the little man was always crooked. Oh no, he was as straight as you or I when this story begins. His name was Jeremy Juggins and he lived by himself in a pretty little cottage. And that wasn't crooked either, in the beginning. Jeremy had built it himself, and he had taken great pains to see that the walls were straight and the roof put on just so. It was after that that the crookedness began. It all happened one market day. Jeremy was upstairs looking at himself in the looking glass as he tied the smart tie, which he always wore to market. When he happened to glance out of the window, and there he saw old Mrs Tibbets, who lived a little way down the lane setting off for town, carrying her basket. The basket looked very heavy, and Jeremy knew that it was loaded with the eggs and butter and cheese, which the old dame was taking to market. Run downstairs, Jeremy, whispered a kind little voice inside him, and help Mrs Tibbets to carry that heavy basket. Don't want to, grumbled Jeremy, and he stood and watched the old lady as she went along the field path through the meadow till she came to a stile, and with great difficulty climbed over it. Then she disappeared from view, and Jeremy thought he had better set out too. But he didn't feel very comfortable inside himself. He still felt he ought to have helped Mrs Tibbets. He wandered along through the field, and swished at the nettles in the ditch with his stick, and threw stones into Farmer Giles' pond. He took so long in his wanderings, that by the time he got to the stile, he had walked quite a mile, a crooked mile at that. And by this time there was something crooked inside Jeremy too. As he climbed over this little stile which was made of a crooked knobbly bits of wood, he saw lying on top of it something bright and shining. He picked it up and saw that it was a sixpenny bit, but rather a funny one, for it was all bent and battered. Why, it's Mrs Tibbet's lucky sixpence, he thought. She showed it to me only the other day. The kind little voice inside him said, Put it in your pocket, and when you see Mrs Tibbets at the market, give it back to her. But the crooked thoughts in Jeremy's head ran like this. Silly old woman, she ought to look after her money better. If she's so careless as to lose it, I shall keep it myself. So on he went, thinking his crooked thoughts, till he came to the market town. It was quite a long way, and by the time he'd got there, he was very hungry and thirsty, and he thought he would go to an inn for some food and drink. He put his hand in his pocket... Oh dear, he'd left all his money at home. He had nothing at all but the little crooked sixpence. He went to the bun store, but the bun lady wouldn't take it for buns. He went to the lemonade shop, but they wouldn't take it either. And when he offered it to the ice cream man, he just laughed. Keep your sixpence, he said, it's as crooked as yourself. 
I'm not crooked, said Jeremy. Look in the glass, said the ice cream man as he trundled his cart away. Jeremy sauntered over to a shop window, and there he saw in the glass. What? Not the straight, upstanding Jeremy he was used to, but a little bent old man with a crooked face. The sight shocked him so much he didn't want to go on looking at things in the market. He decided to rush home. So he went back over the fields and the little stile till he came to Farmer Giles's pond. And there were some cruel boys just going to throw a cat in the water to see if she could swim. You mustn't do that, he cried. Here, give me the poor thing. She's mine, said one of the boys. You'll have to pay me for her. This is all I've got, said Jeremy, holding out the crooked sixpence. It's a lucky sixpence, he added. All right, said the boy, and he took the sixpence and handed over the cat, who went gladly with her new friend. A little farther, and Jeremy was back at his own house again. But, oh, what a shock! Instead of the neat little house with its straight walls, there was a tumble-down shack, with its chimney pots leaning one way and its roof leaning the other. Even the path to the porch was twisty instead of straight. Jeremy opened the crooked door and walked into his crooked kitchen. He sat down on his favourite stool, whose legs had suddenly become twisted, and he looked at his new pet, the cat. He saw that it too was all crooked. Everything seems crooked today, he cried. What can be the matter? And he felt very, very miserable. As he sat there listening to the ticking of the clock, he thought it sounded like the words, Yes. Listen, Jeremy, Jeremy, put it straight, put it straight. Put what straight, he cried. He jumped up and tried to straighten the pictures, which were hanging all crooked on the crooked walls. But no, they hung as crookedly as ever. And still the clock went on. Put it straight, put it straight. Say you're sorry, put it straight. But how can I, cried Jeremy. It's too late to carry Mrs Tibbet's basket now, and I haven't got her crooked sixpence any more. Just at that moment he heard voices outside. He looked out and saw some boys, the ones who had sold him the cat. A sudden idea came to him. He went over to a drawer, and crooked though it was, he managed to get it open. Inside was his money. He took out a bright new sixpence. Then he went to the crooked window and called out, Boys! Here's a nice new sixpence for that old bent one. The boy came running up, glad to change the coins. Well, that's one thing put straight, thought Jeremy. But still, everything was crooked in the little crooked house. And Jeremy felt very, very sad. The cat came and rubbed her crooked back against his knees. But she felt sorry for him. She even managed to catch a mouse and brought it to him to cheer him up. But the mouse was crooked too. And poor Jeremy felt sadder than ever. And still the clock was ticking away. Give it back, give it back. Say you're sorry, give it back. I will, said Jeremy loudly. He got up and took his stick, crooked of course, opened the crooked door and hobbled down his twisty path to his twisty gate. Down the lane he went to Mrs Tibbet's house and knocked on her green painted door. She opened it and Jeremy held out the sixpence. Mrs Tibbet's, he stammered. I brought this back. Why, bless my soul, said the old lady. Wherever did you find it? On the stile, said Jeremy. He was just going away when he thought, I haven't really put it straight. So he said, I knew it was yours, but I didn't give it back to you. And I know I ought to have carried your basket. And I'm very sorry. Oh, oh, Jeremy suddenly felt his back go straight. And when he looked down at the cat, which had followed him and was rubbing against his legs, he saw that it had a straight back too. Home he ran to his little cottage, and there it was, as straight and square as ever. He hurried inside, and there was a little mouse, straight and happy, playing a little game all by itself in front of the fire. It ran into its hole when it saw Jeremy and the cat, and peeped out at them with bright beady eyes. And the old clock in the corner ticked away and said, Well done you. Well done you. Now keep straight. Now keep straight. And Jeremy promised that he would. And that is the story of the little crooked man. The Kind Little Cat Two animals once lived in a house. One was a big dog called Dinah 
and the other was a little cat called Smokey. Dinah and Smokey were very fond of each other. They liked to play together and to sleep together in front of the fire. And one day they did something else together. They each had a family. Dinah had four lovely puppies and Smokey had five tiny kittens. And because they were such good friends, their mistress put Dinah's big basket with the puppies and Smokey's little box with the kittens in the same room together. One day their mistress took Dinah out for a run and when they came back she noticed that the big dog was limping along on three legs and holding up the fourth paw as if it was hurt. What's the matter with your foot, Dinah, she asked. Let me see. She took the paw in her hand and saw there was something sticking in it, making it sore. A piece of grit or a thorn. She tried to get whatever it was out, but she couldn't. We shall have to go to the vet, Dinah, she said. So she went and got the car. You must you leave your babies for a little while, Dinah, she said. We shan't be long. Hop in. So Dinah hopped into the car and off they went. Smokey, in her box, had just finished feeding her kittens and giving them all a good wash, and now she'd settled them all down to sleep. They were very quiet. But the puppies in Dinah's basket were not at all quiet. The mummy had never gone away for so long before, and they did not like it. Mummy! they cried. Mummy, where are you? It was only a little cry at first, but it got louder and louder and louder, till at last they were making a tremendous noise. Smokey in her box felt very sorry for them. Poor little darling, she thought. Their mother really should come back and look after them. I would never leave my babies like that. The puppies cried and cried and at last Smokey said, I must see what I can do. Thank goodness my children are all asleep and quiet. So she jumped out of the box and walked softly over to Dinah's basket and jumped in among the puppies. Hush! Hush, she said, don't make so much noise. Your mummy will be back soon. Now lie down and go to sleep like good children. The puppies were very surprised to find this little grey furry person in their basket instead of their big hairy mother. But what she said was very comforting and after a time they stopped crying and settled down quietly. Now I'll sing you the sleepy song I sing to my kitten, said Smokey. And she sang. Purr, purr, ever so softly till all the puppies were asleep like the kittens. And then Dinah and her mistress came home. The vet had taken the piece of grit out of Dinah's paw and tied it up so it didn't hurt any more. You'd better hurry along to your babies, Dinah, said her mistress. I expect they are hungry and crying for you. They hurried into the room where the box and the basket were. But all was quiet. The five kittens were still fast asleep and in the basket sat Smokey purring away with the puppies asleep all around her. But she jumped out of the basket as soon as she saw Dinah. Why, Smokey, you kind little cat, said her mistress. You've been looking after Dinah's babies as well as your own. And Dinah wagged her tail as she got into her basket. That was her way of saying, thank you, Smokey. The Town Mouse and the Country Mouse There were once two mice who were friends. One lived in the town and the other lived in the country. One day the Town Mouse went to visit his friend in the country. The Country Mouse was delighted to see him and asked him to stay to dinner. 
He brought out his best food, corn and hips and horse and even a piece of bacon rind which he had stolen from the farm kitchen. But the town mouse did not seem to be enjoying his meal. You're not eating very much, said the country mouse. Don't you like my food? I'm sure it's very nice, said the town mouse, but you should just taste the meals I have at home. You really ought to come back to town with me and see how we live there. And he persuaded his friend to come and pay him a visit in his turn. When they came to the town, they crept into a fine house, which the town mouse said was his home. They went into the dining room, where the table was covered with scraps left over from a grand party. The town mouse put his country friend on a sofa seat and ran about tasting all the good food to find out which were the best bits to put before him. The country mouse ate and ate and thought that he had never tasted anything so good. But all at once there was a terrible noise. The doors were being slammed and a huge dog was barking somewhere. The two mice jumped down from the table in terror and fled into a mouse, mouse hole for safety. They were trembling all over and half dead with fear. Then the country mouse said to the town mouse, My friend, I am going back home to my quiet little hole in the country. I would much rather have plain food and peace of mind than rich dainties eaten with a fearful heart. Town life is too dangerous for me. The Lion and the Mouse A lion was once asleep in the forest when a mouse ran over his nose and woke him up. He sprang up in anger, caught the mouse and was just about to kill him when the mouse squeaked out. Oh, Mr Lion, spare my life and one day I will repay your kindness. The lion laughed scornfully. Ha ha, he said. How could a little scrap like you help me? But he let the mouse go. Some time afterwards, hunters came into the forest. They laid a trap for the lion and caught him in a net made of ropes. There he lay, all tied up and roaring with rage. The little mouse heard his roar. That sounds like my friend the lion, he said, and it sounds as if he was in trouble. I will go and see. So he scuttled along through the forest and there lay the lion, all trussed up with cords. This is my chance to repay the lion's kindness, he, he thought, and he set to work to gnaw away at the cords. Soon the net began to give way, and at last the lion was free. You see, said the mouse to the lion, you were wrong when you laughed at me, because I said I would help you one day, but now you know that even a mouse can help a lion. Bar, bar, black sheep. Bar, bar, black sheep, have you any wool? 
Yes, sir, yes, sir, three bags full. One for my master and one for my dame, but none for the naughty boy that lives down the lane. I expect you know that rhyme. Well, here is a story all about it. There was once a little girl called Jenny who lived on a farm with her mummy and daddy. Her daddy was the farmer. One day Jenny came into the kitchen and saw something very surprising. Her mummy's cooker had four ovens, one very hot, one just hot, one fairly hot and one nice and cool. And sticking out of the nice cool oven was a little black woolly head which said, Meh! Oh mummy, said Jenny, a little black lamb in the oven. Yes, said mummy. Her mummy, the sheep, can't feed her, so daddy brought her in here for us to look after. I've put her in the oven to keep her warm. I'm just going to give her a bottle. Would you like to help? Oh yes, said Jenny. So her mummy showed her how to give a baby lamb a bottle. And after that, Jenny used to look after the lamb and often gave her the bottle all by herself. Jenny called the lamb Lulu and she loved her very much. She and her mother took such good care of Lulu that she grew into a great big sheep with lovely thick black wool. People said they had never seen such fine wool on any sheep. When the shearers came to cut the sheep's wool off, said the farmer's wife, I shall keep Lulu's wool separate and have it spun specially and make something very nice out of it. Now down the lane beyond the farm there lived a boy called Jem. He was a rough boy and not very kind. When Lulu grew too big to be in the farmhouse anymore, she was put out in the meadow with the other sheep. And when no one was there to see, Jem used to chase her round and round. And one day he did a really dreadful thing. He threw a stone at her. Luckily it missed, but it might have cut poor Lulu very badly. The farmer's wife was watching out of the window and she saw what Jem did but she didn't say anything just then. Shearing time came and the men cut the wool off all the sheep with the big scissors. It didn't hurt them and they were very glad to have got rid of their heavy hot fleeces. Lulu's lovely black wool was kept separate and the farmer's wife had spun it into balls of wool for her to knit. One day Jem came to the farm to buy some eggs. He went into the farm kitchen and there on the table were three paper bags. Jenny was peeping into them. Look, Jem, she said, here are three bags full of Lulu's wool. Yes, said her mummy, I'm going to knit them into useful things. What are you going to make? asked Jem. First, I'm going to make a big pair of socks to go into the farmer's wellingtons, said the farmer's wife. They will keep his toes warm on cold days. And then I'm going to make a middle-sized pair for myself. And then I'm going to make a smaller pair. Who will they be for? asked Jenny and Jem together. They will be, said the farmer's wife, for the person who has been kindest to Lulu. I wonder who that is. Jem looked down at his feet. He knew he hadn't been kind to Lulu. Jenny had better have them, he said. So you see, there was one bag full for the master, that was the farmer, and there was one bag full for the dame, that was the farmer's wife, but there was none for the naughty boy that lived down the lane, and that was Jem. The song doesn't say anything about Jenny, but she got her nice warm socks all the same. And that is the happy ending of the story. Along by that bank of earth there, so they walked along by the bank looking and calling, but there was no Frisky. Daddy was just saying, well, he isn't here, when Peter called out. Listen! I can't hear anything, said his daddy. Yes, listen, cried Peter. I can hear him barking. They both held their breath and listened. And yes, there was a faint little bark. It seemed to come from right underneath them. He's there, he's there, cried Peter. Look, daddy, there's a hole. He must be down there. I expect he ran in after a rabbit and got stuck, said Peter's daddy. We must go back and get a spade to dig him out. Oh, Daddy, said Peter, please may I stay here and keep you in company? OK, said Daddy, I'll be as quick as I can. So he went off and Peter knelt down by the hole and he kept calling. It's all right, Frisky boy, I'm here. 
Daddy's gone to get a spade and he's coming back to dig you out. I'll stay here till he comes. It's all right, Frisky. And every now and then, Frisky would give a feeble little bark on the ground to show he understood. Last Peter's daddy came with the spade and began to dig. He dug and he dug and he dug until at last he put the spade aside and put his arm right down into the earth of the bank and pulled out a little mucky dog. It was Frisky, all covered with mud and soil and earth. Frisky shook himself and then he gave a great big sneeze. And then Peter got hold of him and held him tight as if he would never let him go. He was so glad to get his little dog back. Peter carried Frisky home and the first thing he had was a great big bowl of water. He drank and he drank and he drank because he was so thirsty. And then he had a good dinner. And after that he forgot all about that dreadful time when he was buried in the dark hole in the bank and was all ready to start chasing rabbits again. But Mummy said, Bedtime! And when Peter's daddy came to say goodnight to Peter, he said, You know, Peter, you were really the one who rescued Frisky. It was you who thought of looking in the bank, and it was your sharp ears that heard him barking. We might never have found him without your help. And when he heard that, Peter was very glad. The Boy Who Cried Wolf There was once a shepherd boy who watched his flock of sheep on a hillside. In the olden days there were wild beasts such as wolves in the forest and it was a shepherd's duty to keep his flock safe from them. One day the boy thought he would have some fun and he began to call out. Wolf! Wolf! The men working in the fields heard him and they came running to his help thinking that a wolf must be attacking the sheep. But when they reached the flock the boy laughed at them and said that it had only been a joke. After that he often called out wolf just to see the men come running up the hillside. But then one day, a wolf really did come. Wolf! Wolf! cried the boy. But the men in the field shrugged their shoulders and went on working. It's only that boy again, they said. We're not going to be caught out by his tricks this time. Meanwhile, the wolf was leaping among the sheep and worrying them, and the silly boy could do nothing to save his flock.